In today's video, we're going over a list of 20 things I thought were pretty nasty in Fear Hunger 2 Termina. There's a lot more than 20 in the game, but these were just the first 20 I thought of. I will be doing more, so please leave suggestions for items on my next list in the comments. The intro. Before anything else, I'd like to say I really liked the intro sequence for Termina. It's brief, atmospheric, and it really gives you a taste of what's to come, but without revealing too much. The game opens with the player character having drifted asleep on a train heading for Preheville, lulled to sleep by the peaceful and rhythmic motion of the train swaying back and forth. The player awakes suddenly and sees the blue moth girl, Rayla, run off down the train wagon. We can see other characters like Tanaka and Marco also asleep on the train, but trying to rouse them fails. They are in a unnaturally deep sleep. Proceeding down the hall, we see a makeshift constructed doorway that seems to lead to a dark portal where the train's wall should be. Taking it, the game lets us know that we are no longer in the train, but somewhere new. A wooden workshop with benches littered with small gray cube figurines. The deformed janitor makes his appearance and forces us to sit down to assemble cubes. After making a few, we can see that Rayla attempts to make a run for it. Following her, we're caught by the janitor. After a fight, the janitor severs the player's legs saying, let's see you dash around like a little jailbird without these chicken thighs of yours and leaves you to get back to work. Here, we are viscerally introduced to the dismemberment sound that we will be hearing more than a few times throughout the game. Feeling completely helpless, wandering around the room, looking for and failing to find an exit or help, the player will experience a sudden headache accompanied by a severe ear-piercing sound. Losing consciousness momentarily, the player has a premonition of the future, of briefly being in the Hall of Gods surrounded by the many incarnations of the new gods. A flash, the player is whole again with all of their limbs, but now we are standing on top of a massive tower overlooking the surrounding town. Perkele, a oddly dressed man with a feather covered robe and a purplish hue to his skin, gives us the introduction to the festival of Termina and tells us what the player will need to know to survive this grisly game. The moon scorched villagers. Approaching the city, we start to get an idea of what happened to the local population when the moon scorching happened and the festival was unleashed onto Preheville. We see a few surviving townspeople standing catatonically looking at the sky, scratching at the flesh on their faces and sometimes peeling strips of it off. Talking to them, they appear to be half distant, talking about the moon scorching everything and the green hue that came with it. They are the last survivors of the swarm dwellers that lived here. Talking to them in combat reveals little other information other than they are digging their nails into their faces. One of them reveals that he wants you to hurt him. Just to end this for him, he yells take it off like it's burning. He's talking about his skin, that his skin is burning. None of these moon scorched villagers fight back at all. They're just passively waiting for the end that they hope is sooner rather than later. There is only one moral and humanitarian thing to do here. You whip out the bench grinder and make it quick. Not wanting to leave anything useful behind, you then take out the bone saw and remove the heads from the villagers. Battered as they may be, they will still make a good offering to the new gods. Dinner with the mayor. Dinner with the mayor sounds like something top students of the local high school would get for winning the national spelling bee. But obviously, Things are a bit more sinister in Fear and Hunger 2. 
sitting down for dinner with either the gentleman or a moon-scorched Hendrick, depending on how things play out, we are treated to this monster's idea of a fine meal. The mayor will present you with some nauseating variations on what he calls exquisite local cuisine. Here, the player will have to weight their options, trying to anticipate what the gentleman wants to hear. Giving him the wrong answer will prompt him to fly into a rage and attack the player. While he isn't particularly difficult, the player will initially encounter him early on in the game, before having much of a chance to get better equipment or a full party. The image of each of the different food items are very off-putting and very phallic. The sausage thing and the mushroom look particularly unpleasant. Not the type of thing you'd like to see when you sit down for dinner, but the gentleman seems delighted and is loving every second of the meal, like it was Thanksgiving, and grandma didn't fucking overcook the turkey for once. And it's actually nice, juicy, and has flavor. Personally, I'm more of a pork guy myself. Turkeys don't seem to have too many redeeming qualities. Navigating the conversation and telling the mayor what he wants to hear three times will befriend him and prompt him to give the player one of the two keys needed to get past the gate and head into the city. The Woodsman. He is a man that lives in the woods and he makes one hell of an entrance the first time we encounter him, stepping out of the fog to decapitate a villager in a single swipe. He is scary, nasty, and oddly tragic. We encounter him right at the beginning of the game, not far from where the train stopped. We find out from the wretched being in the slums that the woodsman eagerly embraced the festival of Termina and took out a large part of the slum dwellers himself. He wears an open trench coat, revealing his alien face hugger appendage. He is like a nightmare combination of a trench coat flasher and xenomorph. In combat, you'll want to take out his axe first since it's very capable of dismembering any members of your party. Taking him out and hopefully dodging his appendage when it lunges at you, you'll get the basement key to unlock the basement in his house nearby. Entering the building, we see that the basement door has multiple chains on it going back and forth and is barred shut. There's also a blood trail leading up to it. The design of the locks on this door is kind of reminiscent on the locks in the apartment in Silent Hill 4. Descending into the basement, we see a bloody outline of a sigil to rare and a corpse sitting in a chair next to it. Here, we learn about the infidelity that occurred between the woodsman and his wife, and the goat, when she cheated on him with the goat outside, though that goat is not a mere goat as may appear at first. So in retaliation, the woodsman kills his wife in rage. We can find a letter of hers admitting to it and taunting the woodsman about her new lover's girth. If we use a chalk to draw the sigil of rare in the ritual circle, we can enter the other realm and talk to the mysterious man in black. He asks us if we believe in darkness and talks about the contrast of the dark with the light, how one complements and requires the other. He laments humanity, turning to and embracing science, and he says that he will help us out on our quest and then promptly disappears. Don't you just hate it when you're speaking to somebody and they just disappear into the ether? Going back outside, the GOAT is now a recruitable member for your party and will help you along your journey to decipher the mysteries of Termina and the festival. Alright, next is the public toilet, an unasked for throwback to the original game. And like in the first game, it serves no purpose. If you jump in there, there's no way of climbing out. But to be fair, the game never gives you any indication that you should jump down there. And it promptly lets you know that it was a poor decision. If you can think of any possible reason why jumping down this toilet is a good idea, go ahead and put it in the comments, I'm very curious. But either way, gamers are known for their curiosity. And if a game gives you the option to do something, somebody will eventually do it. There are a few more unnerving little details that the game slides in. First of all, why is it public? Don't get me wrong, perhaps it was stuck in the past. But it doesn't seem that stuck in the past. It doesn't seem like it would have been much work to make more stalls. Also, the game does mention semen traces everywhere, and why? I don't want to know, really. And I'm okay with that. Let's move on to the next one. Dirty toilet paper. In both Funger 1 and 2, the player will frequently have to deal with the bleed status effect, which is not surprising given the nature of the game, from either stepping on a nail or losing another limb. The player will always have a need to have cloth fragments on hand, but in Termina, a new item that can stop bleeding was introduced. Behold the dirty toilet paper. 
Would you rather bleed to death or die from an infection? Dirty toilet paper item gives you that option, which I'm sure everybody has been clamoring for. But if you have a green herb and dirty toilet paper, you can treat bleeding, but you'll get infected. Because, well, you treated an open wound with dirty toilet paper that you found in the trash. But then you can use the green herb to treat the infection. So it's all good. Fortunately, I'm currently spending a lot of time with my one-year-old, and I can tell you from personal experience that the in-game sprite art for the item is far less graphic than it could be. At least the item is not called a dirty diaper. All right, next. The department store. I do appreciate the build-up to this one. The player has just made it to the Preheavo Bop in the center of the city, and is now properly starting the exploration of the center of the city while locating the three effigies. The anticipation builds at the thought of what lies in wait as you go through the environment that once appeared normal, but now is eerily quiet, with only weird creatures found in the fog. You enter a department store, seemingly the most normal location so far, with this distinctive sense of modernity and normality. A coffee bar, stools, wide tall ceiling, fixtures, lightings, rugs, but you can hear a distant echo, a yelling in the far distance. As you go deeper into the department store, they get louder, it's screaming, it's coming from the top of the department store. Ascending the stairs, the screaming gets clearer, becoming more of a noise rather than a distant echo. Reaching the top, we are greeted with the grisly display that we have been hearing since we entered the department store. I'm not sure how much I'll be able to show you since it's a bit gruesome, but let me say, you find a group of people suspended from the ceiling with chains, most seemingly still alive and moving, some being tormented like the human husk did in the Tower of the Tormented in the original game. And just a note, if the player keeps exploring, they will find a useful ring at the very top being held by what seems to be a desiccated corpse. Caligura. I just do not like this dude. How hateful he is stands in stark contrast with how endearing the other 13 participants of the festival are. Even his character portrait looks off. He looks like a deep one from a HP Lovecraft story rather than a human male. And he is absolutely unpleasant. He's either trying to assault you while you're sleeping or telling you to go fuck yourself. And he's not even witty or clever about it. At least Pav comes off as an intriguing character that makes you wonder what his deal and is far more eloquent. Caligura is just malice incarnate, like something the sulfur god would have spawned onto the earth to punish humanity. Caligura is the one participant of the festival that really goes all in during the events of the game. He tries to kill Tanaka, Marco, Levi, while assaulting a few other characters if he's given the chance. He is the worst of the participants in Gear and Funger too. It's almost like, what if humans are the real monsters? Someone should make a movie about that. Nazra's head. In kind of a funny follow-up from the first game, we have the appearance of Nazra's raisin-looking head, which now looks like a dried-up raisin. This confirms that he did indeed get burnt up by the traces of Grogoroth in the first game. Nazra's head is found by Osa in his backstory. Osa left his hometown to continue his studies into religion and the otherworldly, which brings Osa to the Kingdom of Rongdon. Having joined an expedition to the Dungeon of Fear and Hunger, Osa enters the ruins of the dungeon by himself. Feeling the call of the other world, Osa finds Nazra's head under a pile of rocks in the dungeon. During the events of the game and the festival of Termina, Nazra's head is relegated to being an item that can sometimes reflect spells back at the caster, which can be kind of useful in some situations and in the final confrontation at the tower. If playing as Osa, Nazra will become an annoying and crude backseat driver during the game, constantly cursing at Osa, but sometimes with some insight and history. Nasra will yell out obscenities to Osa every time the poor man takes a break and closes his eyes for some rest. At the very end of the game, we do get an interesting scene where Nasra and Lagarde follow up the discussion they had in the first game. In part two, they'll debate about the nature of humanity and the meaning of chaos and order. Should humanity be confined to a rigid system of order or is humanity chaotic and needs to be unbound to fully develop? The vial. Continuing the old tradition of spraying fish with pesticide, we first encounter the vial in the slums, 
spraying down local catch. A dweller of the slums, he wears a pig mask that has fused with his face, meaning that it cannot be taken off. It's part of his face. He carries a pesticide tank that he wields as a melee weapon and sprays any survivors down with poison. Not much is known about the vial, how he survived the festival, what he's doing, what drives him, why he's spraying down fish with pesticide, or why he's wearing a pig mask and how did it fuse with his face. But his presence is troubling and his corruption is emblematic of the fall of Preheville. Poe death animation. In central Preheville, in the back of the store, Dr. Kiefer's Tricks and Magic, there is a magic lamp resting on the desk. Walking up to it and interacting with it, you have the option of rubbing it. Afterwards, a disturbance in the radio next to you will be noticeable. Hanging around too long, we see a Poe or a ghost materialize out of the radio and start chasing you after he sees you. Fighting him, he only has one attack, and that's to try to catch you in the grasp of a genie, a coin flip attack. If he's successful, well, he'll do this. A side note here, when I was recording footage for this segment, I had some of the best luck I've ever had with coin flips and just wouldn't die. I must have won like four coin flips in a row, which has about a 6% probability of occurring. But I always find it entertaining how you always seem to win coin flips when you don't need to. It's like the game knows. So you can see this one took a little bit longer to get the footage. I was like, ghost, I just need footage of you sticking your hand on my butt. Moving on to the next nasty thing depicted in Fear Hunger 2 Termina, and that's addiction. Getting real here for a second, through Levi, we get a glimpse of what it is to deal with addiction. Addiction is a neurophysical disorder characterized by strong physical or psychological urge or need to do something or use something, which can be a problem when that compulsion gets in the way of one's long-term goals or ability to function in a healthy and happy fashion. Some forms of addiction are more accepted and more benign than others. Likewise, some are more damaging and more harmful. A caffeine addiction isn't even something people notice or that will affect your ability to function in society. Others, like heroin, well, you know. Addiction is a very real condition that can trap someone in a habit where they can be participants and witness to their own downfall. Being a participant in destroying your lifestyle, alienating loved ones, or destroying your financial and physical health. Playing as Levi or having Levi in your party, you will have to manage his cravings and his withdrawals from heroin, which he became addicted to during the war when he was seeing his fellow child soldiers being butchered in trenches. His addiction provided an outlet and a form of escapism for him, understandably. Addiction's a nasty disease, so if you're struggling with it, don't give up on yourself and don't be too hard on yourself. It's okay and it's normal to have moments when you aren't your best, and it's okay to reach out for help. Moving on, the neighbor's tongue. While Fear and Hunger 2 has lots of disgusting or off-putting monsters, for some reason, the neighbor creature always stuck in my mind. Be it the normal looking shirt that's wearing backwards, to the large tumor looking bludgeons that they have for hands, but most of all, the deformed face and the hyperactive tongue. Neighbors can be found in white mode apartments and the sewers primarily. Their location and name suggest that they were at one point ordinary inhabitants of the city that must have been corrupted by some otherworldly force and distorted into these weird shapes that they have now. But for some reason, it's their tongue just whipping back and forth like it had too much caffeine. That always creeps me out. The Crimson Heads. Crimson Heads are otherworldly snails that are summoned to locations with great bloodshed, much in the same way that snails come out after it rains. Crimson Heads are able to submerge themselves in pools of blood to regenerate their physical bodies. They wield knives and are able to use mind control to compel others to continue the bloodshed. Blood for the blood god. Crimson Heads are found underneath the Church of Almer, in a dark secluded area that has recently seen a lot of bloodshed. Bloodshed that the Crimson Heads then pushed further. They were summoned to the basement underground and then used their mind control powers to make the church members and the dark priests continue the violence and turn upon each other. We find mutilated bodies cut up into pieces in the basement, showing the ritual sacrifices the Crimson Heads and the dark priests were engaged in. So the Crimson Heads are magic blood snails that like stabbing. The head juice extractor in the other world apartments. Getting past the washing machine puzzle in the white mode apartments, 
By reading the diary of a madman, we enter the otherworldly version of the apartments. Among the wooden structures and the neighbor creatures, in what would be the apartments, headless bodies can be found propped up in chairs. Tubes are coming out of their neck, and fluid is visibly flowing through them. Purpose unknown. In one of the rooms, we see two large pumps actuating, moving the extract through the tubes. As far as I know, there's no known purpose for this fluid extraction operation. It's yet another mystery of the gods in the world of fear and hunger. The image of a human farm and its associated extraction operation definitely makes this image stand out in the menagerie of horrors that we find in the world of fear and hunger. Ron Shambara's Poetry The lost city of Mahabra will house a lot of mysteries, terrors, and lore of a world that predates and supersedes the world of humanity. Some of this ancient knowledge and wisdom that survived is some of Ron Shambara's poetry from his life as a poet before joining the fellowship, venturing to Mahabra, and ascending to become a new god. Ron Shambara, who we talked about in my last video, was once a tortured artist and poet, quite in contrast to the appearance of the tormented so that we see in Mahabra during the events of the first game. And let me tell you, did you think you knew about all the horrors these games have in store for you? Well, let me introduce you to a new one, Chambara's Poetry, found in the book New Poems of Love and Torment. Thanks to my wife for agreeing to help with the reading of Chambara's poetry, The Blackened Heart. Poem 1, The Blackened Heart. Stakes are high, you are also, and more so. Live your lie, and play with my blood torso. Who would believe all your tries? to blacken my name, dead crow as a prize. They say that a tear only dries. So, I want to see the day even Grogoroth cries. They will come to know this day as the cruel age. They will come to know this page as the fourth phase. Won't you die? So stupid. <laughs> Father Hugo, I find the orphanage to be one of the most unsettling and tragic portions of fear and hunger. The contrast of the safety and happiness that I should have brought the orphans against the sad and brutal reality of what happened here. The music is lethargic. The enemies here are more pathetic and sad rather than dangerous. The other world version of the orphanage features trenches similar to the ones that a lot of orphans will be recruited into the army to die in. In the back of the building, on the second floor, you'll find Father Hugo's office. Two ritual circles will be found at the entrance, one to Grogoroth, implying blood sacrifices, and one to Sylvian, with his own implications. Father Hugo can be found standing in his office with his arms wide in embrace. He rushes to you if you get too close. The in-combat dialogue says that he's continually approaching you with his arms spread out and making the sign of the cross. An eerie figure made worse by his being a priest and wearing a frock. At some point, like a drunken friend at 3 a.m., he'll proclaim that he wants to take off his clothes. Always be careful with people that feel the need to strip down during a fight. He then sets the room on fire and continues to fight naked. He is surprisingly jacked for a priest. Maybe the orphanage diet offered a lot of protein. I just wanted to make a joke about the priest being ripped. Now I'm troubled by the implications of thinking about where they got the protein. But to be fair, I don't think the lore insinuates anything about cannibalism. Anyway, Father Hugo is disturbing. But before moving on, this video is brought to you by you. I'm making these because they're being watched. So I just wanted to take a second and say thank you. I hope you're enjoying them. All right, number 18 on our list, the Bobbies. The Bobbies are part monster, part police, all horror. Former public servants that have been exposed to the moon scorch. Now, they patrol the main streets of Preheville looking for survivors. Their heads are moving unnaturally fast back and forth, following in the great horror tradition started in the movie Jacob's Ladder and the series Silent Hill. They have multiple arms, meaning they can deliver several attacks in quick succession. Attacking the limbs will easily dismember them, but they will grow back soon. Attacking his legs, knocking him off balance, will make his head stop twitching and become vulnerable. After the fight, inspecting a Bobby's body will show that he's still warm and pulsating. If left alone, it will regenerate and the Bobby will stand up again. Bobbies have to be beaten again to make sure they don't stand up. Between their twitching heads, abuse of authority, and general yuckiness, I definitely think the Bobbies are some of the nastier creatures we encounter. Number 19, Caligura, again. 
but in his Moon Scorched form. I do not like Caligura. Have I mentioned that? His Moon Scorched form does deserve mention for his design and its one liners. Once Moon Scorched, Caligura can be found in the sewers in his monster form. He is obscene, constantly yelling out to gargle his balls, and his attack is primarily by spewing toxic poison at the party. His design is inspired by, well, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? So all in all, encountering him in his monster form is definitely an affront on the senses. Caligura is one of the characters in the game that is inspired by a real historical person. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to see how Caligura stands up to Caligula. And oddly, I'm not sure the in-game Caligura is the worst of the two. So here are some highlights from the Wikipedia article on the Roman Emperor Caligula. Disclosure, some of these are believed to be contemporaneous propaganda of the time. But hey, it makes for good stories. And it, if you like sex and violence, I highly recommend checking out Roman history. It is wild. Quote, they described him as an insane emperor who was self-absorbed and short-tempered, who killed on a whim and indulged in too much spending and sex. He is accused of sleeping with other men's wives and bragging about it, killing for mere amusement, deliberately wasting money, causing starvation, and once, at some games at which he was presiding, he was said to have ordered his guards to throw an entire section of the audience into the arena during intermission to be eaten by wild beast because there were no prisoners to be used and he was bored. Caligula was also accused of incest with his sisters and it was said that he prostituted them to other men. Additionally, there are mentions of various affairs he had with other men, including his brother-in-law, Marcus Lepidus. They say that he'd sent troops on illogical military exercises, turned the palace into a brothel, and most famously, made his horse his consul, and appointed a priest to serve him. And last on our list for today, the Sojobs. Sojobs are constructed monsters made from different body parts, sewn together and brought to life by unnatural means. Found descending from above in different parts of the city, we find out their origins while visiting Bunker 1, where we find Stitches and her other unnatural experiments with the human form and body parts. I think it can be argued that the Soul Job's appearance may draw a little bit of inspiration from Mary Shelley's description of the Frankenstein monster being composed of different discarded body parts that were sewn together after death and then reanimated to create a creature that doesn't conform with the natural order. It's been a long time since I've read it. I do recommend reading Frankenstein. It is a scary but sometimes heartfelt story and is considered to be the first sci-fi novel ever written. Anyways. While the Sojob is creepy and unsettling, at least they are fortunately some of the least deadly monsters that you will encounter in Preheve and have fairly low HP. They're fairly easy to deal with. And that's all for my list today. Thank you very much for watching. Take care, have a good one, and later.